Hello and welcome to your region this week. I'm Anandi Carol Woolery. On average, four people a day are killed by drunk drivers in Canada. Mad Canada aims to reduce this through their Red Ribbon campaign. Mad Canada launched a national campaign at Waterloo Regional Police's headquarters last week. Here's what you need to know. Mad Canada's goal with Project Red Ribbon is always to make people think about impaired driving, how unsafe it is, how unnecessary it is, how it devastates lives, and there's no reason for it to happen in this day and age. So be smart, make the right choice, don't ever drive impaired. Whether that be alcohol or drugs, it doesn't matter. Anything that impairs your ability to drive, just stay home, you know, find another alternative way to get home. As you can see behind me, uh, we have a family who lost their lives. Uh, due to impaired driving, uh, the Vandemore family from Saskatchewan, and a mother, a father, a young boy, a young girl, and their lives are devastated. The family, as you say, Chief Larkin, you know, the families who are impacted by this, uh, you know, the ripple effect, the devastating loss that will be with them forever, um, you can't recover from that. Uh, you know, people talk about a, a new normal. Uh, and that's what it is, it's a new normal, it'll never be the same and that includes for those who are injured. Every single day we see the carnage and uh, it's a very difficult, uh, complex world we live in but if you can imagine having to go to somebody's house, whether it be 2, 3 in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning and knock on the door uh, to express that somebody's lost their life is a very concerning, very concerning issue um, and we're human. And so we take that very deeply. We see the pain. We work with Mad Canada. We see the volunteers who have lost loved ones and victims of impaired driving. And that has an emotional toll. So uh, again, we encourage people who are going through the RIDE program uh, to say thank you to our officers and to those that are out there supporting uh, a safe roadway for all. We have a very clear message is that if you're going to go out and consume, whether it be uh, cannabis or alcohol, uh, choose another ride. Uh, we believe that everybody should drive sober and that means zero. Uh, that's our perspective as a police service. And so whether you have the one drink at dinner uh, or you enjoy uh, having uh, some cannabis, we encourage you to find an alternative means home, a safe ride home. We don't want to be a party pooper. We want people to enjoy the festive season, but plan an alternative way home. This, this time of year with the festive season coming in, we know impaired driving is an issue every single day of the year. Uh, but particularly now over this season, we know there's a lot of celebrations, a lot of people hit, going out, enjoying themselves, and often alcohol or drugs may be part of those celebrations. And as much as you're allowed to enjoy yourself and, and have fun, uh, when you put yourself and your passengers and the highways at risk by getting to a vehicle and driving, you know, I've been called to countless number of crashes where an impaired driver has claimed a life of an innocent victim that was uh, going back and forth, who was making the right decisions, but sadly uh, their life was cut short because of someone's poor decision. Here's a chance for you to stand up publicly and acknowledge that you will not drive impaired. Take a red ribbon, tie it around your vehicle, tie it around uh, your briefcase, your backpack, whatever it is, your keychain. So every time you hold your keys, you see that red ribbon and you know that you will not get into your vehicle after you've been drinking. It's a simple gesture and it, it spreads the message of uh, safe and sober driving for everyone. Uh, we can all do our part and we need the public to be part of our solution. Uh, our message to viewers is that, uh, you know, Mad Canada is here to support you, to support victims and survivors, and to make sure people don't drive impaired. And uh, if we can save a life, one life even, it will be well worth it. The United Way Perth Huron wraps up their Living Wage Week campaign by announcing an 11 cent increase from 17.44 an hour to 17.55. We speak with Ryan Erb, Executive Director of the Perth Huron Division, about this decision and how this can help those in the county. Well, the living wage calculation is, has been set up uh, through the Ontario Living Wage Network so that it's standardized across the province. And so um, it entails taking into um, consideration things like transportation costs, uh, things like food costs, things like housing costs. And when you aggregate that information in each community uh, and do the math, you end up with a slightly different number for each community because of the higher or lower costs associated. So for example, in our community here in Perth Huron, our number is actually higher than neighboring cities like Kitchener or London because the cost of transportation is higher for people to get to and from work. Uh, the cost of food is often higher in our region too, um, where there's not as many large grocery stores in some of our communities. Those kinds of things make a difference. We have a number of organizations that have certified uh, in the region now nearly 20 and there's another 30 or 40 that are in the midst of considering it. So we're just getting started. Uh, we've been at this for less than 
thousand a year certifying people in our region. But in town here in Stratford, organizations like the Scottish Shop, which is a retail organization downtown, um, the cooperators and others have already joined. And so all kinds of organizations, including us here at the United Way, are certified living wage employers. Well, we, we talk about the living wage as a, a conversation that is meant to help everyone understand the challenges that people face who live on less uh, in that in our community. So we recognize that when you don't have um, that amount to live on that you're making difficult choices. So many people are literally choosing between paying rent and having healthy food to eat. And that's not a choice that we want to say is acceptable uh, in our community. On the other hand, we recognize that businesses are challenged to pay living wages. It's not easy if you're a business owner necessarily to wake up tomorrow and pay a living wage if you haven't already been doing so. So we, we want to talk about that conversation, have that conversation with people, and then recognize the benefits that there are to being a certified living wage employer. So for example, when employers uh, become living wage employers and pay at that level, they tell us that absenteeism uh, reduces, turnover for employees reduces, productivity increases, and many of them will even say that it's better for their bottom line. So if we can build businesses that believe in that in our community um, and have opportunities for, for everyone to live and work in our communities at sustainable levels, it's better all around. Your Region This Week will be right back after this. Welcome back. The Ontario government has announced that the province's deficit has dropped to $9 billion in their most recent fiscal update. Mike Farwell speaks with Waterloo NDP MPP Catherine Fife on what this means going forward. Catherine Fife is the NDP MPP for Waterloo and joins us for a conversation. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Very good, thanks. Excellent. What's your takeaway from the fall economic statement yesterday? So I mean, this is a this is a government that's obviously in full damage control. Uh, I would I would call that this this fall economic statement, which is essentially a mini budget, it it really should be called same as it ever same as it ever was. Uh, I think that Mike Crawley actually from CBC called it a sleight of hand. And so what you've seen is a government that has seen some pushback on uh, certain items. In, uh, in their spending overtures and now has to sort of walk some of those back. And so I think, you know, our leader, Andrea Horvath, said yesterday, is, is a cut that wasn't fully realized really a spending increase? And we would say no. And uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't address the damage that we're seeing, particularly on the health care file in Ontario, but also on education. And uh, so uh, it's, it's interesting to see them twist themselves into different shapes to try to look, you know, more ca compassionate and less callous. But at the end of the day, the measures that the finance minister, the new finance minister, took yesterday uh, do not address, you know, the real concerns that we're hearing in Waterloo Region, but across the province. What are some of those concerns that you are hearing? So, I mean, we have, we have an economy that requires skilled trade workers, for instance. Uh, the education file is very important uh, for all Ontarians. It's particularly important in Waterloo Region. And, you know, this government has said, okay, we want more skilled trades courses, uh, specialist courses in our schools. And yet at the same time, they're increasing class sizes, which reduces teachers in schools, which then goes on to reduce those choices that students have in the education system, including skilled trade options. So they they... They're a walking contradiction on many of these initiatives. They're, uh, as I said, I mean, they're in full public relations mode. Um, so the education piece is truly concerning for Ontario parents and for students themselves. I'm hearing from high school students in my office in Waterloo. Uh, the other issue around public health and where you know, where money can be spent, where it is, you know, the return on investment is good for all citizens in Ontario. And, and one of those places, obviously, is public health and the prevention of diseases. And we are hearing from uh, across the province that people are having a hard time accessing doctors, waiting in hallways, in hospitals, even accessing the flu shot. So I, I think that, you know, our job as, as the official opposition here at Queen's Park is to make sure that we keep the pressure on this government so that, you know, those, the proposed spending cuts on health care and on education are not fully realized. In fact, we'll make the case for investment in those areas. So when the government says, Catherine, that it's got 
an additional $1.3 billion in spending. What what are you hearing instead? Well, we know that that $1.3 billion was actually set to be cut. So instead of following through on those cuts, uh, they they're not going to they're not going to fully realize them. Uh, the the overall budget for the province of Ontario is 163.4 billion dollars, and there is you know that sleight of hand piece that I mentioned earlier in the interview is real. The auditor general has said that the overall deficit is seven billion dollars. Uh, the finance minister said yesterday that they're looking at a nine billion dollar deficit. So that's a two billion dollars is a lot of money, uh, and you know there there are obviously good places to invest that money in. Would you say that there has been uh, the the better tone that we had hoped for since the legislature resumed last week? Well, I, it was it was an uncomfortable first week because you could see that they were really trying to you know um, to try to be nicer, if you will. Um, but this week has you know the the premier and and some of his ministers have fallen back into some of the the, the same patterns. And and I mean I really just think that you know they when these MPPs go back to their ridings, they're outside of the bubble here at Queen's Park where, you know, the Premier says, you know, you're all all all-stars and everything is working. When they go back to their ridings, you know, they're running into the nurses who have lost their jobs. Uh, Teachers and parents are obviously upset with some of the changes that are happening in education, and they're worried about, you know, a Minister of Education who tries to negotiate a contract here in the media studio at Queen's Park. So I think that that pressure... uh, um, is working in some respects, but we have to make sure that this government fully understands that, you know, when they make transit plans on the back of a napkin, that costs taxpayers in time, in productivity, and as we've seen from the public-private partnerships, including down in Cambridge, uh, a, a lot of wasted money. And we want to see this government more focused on the people that we are all elected to serve. Has this government finally figured it out on the autism file? Almost $300 million more into those programs, bringing the budget to $600 million for autism services. Well, so, and as you know, the autism file is so emotionally charged because uh, they they really felt that they were harmed by the former Liberal government and then put through the ringer, a small solution was found. This government try to put their own branding on, you know, what families would access and what kind of therapy they would access. Uh, the, the expert panel, including one of our own, Janet McLaughlin, was sat on that panel, uh, has put forward a report. To, to date, though, Mike, there's been no full action on that. And, you know, that will be the challenge is that, you know, governments of all stripes get good research and good evidence and information. It's how they implement those ideas. And so I, I think that this government is feeling fairly burned by that decision, uh, that their original decision. And I just genuinely hope they get it right on this one. Catherine, we always appreciate the time. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Mike. Have a good day. You too. Bye bye. Catherine Fife is the NDP MPP for Waterloo. Your region this week will continue after these messages. Welcome back. 519 Sports Online gives us a look at the Waterloo Warriors and the Cambridge Hawks hockey game. Let's see who came out on top. The two teams meeting on Sunday night in minor midget hockey at the Galt Arena Gardens. First period, great play by Andy Reist. From his knees, he sends Hunter Nagy. Shorthanded break, Nolan Chartrand. Big save for the Hawks. No score after the first. Early in the second, this is Ty Higgins breaking in. It goes to Cole Pelly. He opens the scoring. Pelly puts it in. 1 0 Waterloo. Later, Cambridge power play, Andy Reist leading by example. The Wolves captain blocks the shot and he clears it out. Waterloo would kill off the penalty. At the other end, it's a terrific defensive play by Wyatt Kerr. He blocks the pass, taking away a good scoring chance. Still, 1-0 Waterloo. A few minutes later, the Wolves win the faceoff. Back to Liam Evely. He fires into traffic and scores. 
scores. He puts Waterloo up by a pair. It's 2-0. The Hawks looking to answer. Matthew Free centers. Austin Kelleher redirects it home. Cambridge is on the board after a nice tip. It's 2-1. The Hawks now on the power play trying to tie it up. Jake LaRue fires it off the boards. Evan Silvera chases it down and he sends the water bottle flying. Silvera scoring a shorty. 3-1 Waterloo after two. Third period. Here come the Hawks. Victor student Ethan Decay over to Kyle Caron. We've got a one-goal game. Caron buries it, making it 3-2. Then 43 seconds later, the puck comes to Noah Clugston, and he ties the game. The Hawks strike for two quick goals. They pull even. It's three all. After the goal, the Wolves calling it timeout trying to regroup watch the Hawks bench on this play Steve Lescovar levels Evan Klein he goes over the boards and ends up on the Cambridge bench Klein would be okay after taking that hit from the Cambridge captain final minute of regulation still 3-3 Lucas Carson to Evan Klein to Andy Reist you can call him Captain Clutch Reese buries it with 15.4 seconds left on the clock. He gives Waterloo a 4-3 lead in the dying seconds, and that goal is your winner. The Wolves take a thriller on the road over the Hawks. 4-3 is the final. Here is Reese talking about his game-winning goal. Obviously, there wasn't much time left last shift of the game. Carson was working down low really hard, fed Kleiner. Um, you know, it was kind of a broken play, but Klein, um, he fed it right over to me. Beauty pass, and I kind of fanned on it, but posted in, it worked out. It obviously felt real nice. Um, in Cambridge, too, you know, these guys were working really hard, Cambridge, and, you know, we stuck with our system. Um, we are working on our discipline still, but um, overall, I think it was a great game by everyone. It felt pretty great. My family was in the stands, um, got me kind of going there. I didn't know how much room I got, so I just kept on skating. I felt like if I missed a net, that would kind of been embarrassing. So like, I kind of like felt the pressure. This is my old home. This is my hometown. So uh, just getting it in just felt really good. With scam artists becoming more frequent and harder to avoid, Waterloo Regional Police's Fraud Squad implemented a Fraud Prevention Week to show on how to keep your money and identity safe. Typically, with uh, identity theft in our region and, and elsewhere, of course your mail uh, is stolen or your wallet is stolen from your motor vehicle or in a break and enter uh, and your ID um, is used for nefarious purposes. There are certain things you can do in order to best prevent being a victim of, of identity theft and we encourage you to at least annually conduct credit checks with the national credit agencies uh, and those are TransUnion and Equifax. It shows all of your accounts uh, that are in your name. Some may be yours and hopefully are all yours, but some may have been created by fraudsters. If that is the case, then you may be a victim of, uh, of identity theft. If that is the case, you need to contact the police. The credit agencies will also put an alert on your file. Phishing is also a way by which fraudsters steal your identity. The phishing occurs when a deceptive email or text message is sent to you uh, and it's these messages are sent to the masses and, and the fraudster are just counting on that at least you know one person and hopefully more will actually take the bait and hence the hence the name phishing some people will click on on a link or um, or an attachment and that's your identity may already be compromised by that point so in order to prevent yourself from being a victim of identity theft do not click on any links or, or attachments these messages are all unsolicited if it's unsolicited just simply delete the message your region this week we'll be right back Welcome back. 
Sean Fafaro has the highlights of the Guelph Storm and the Kitchener Rangers over the past week. Kitchener would host the Owen Sound attack on Friday night in the first period. It's the Owen Sound attack getting on the board first. It's Barrett Kerwin's sixth of the year. Shortly after that, it would be Aiden Dudas shorthanded on a Kitchener power play. Into the second period, Barrett Kerwin's second puts the attack up two to nothing. But the Rangers come back in the third. First, Ville Odevainen scores, and a minute and a half later, it's Declan McDonald scoring for the third straight game. The Rangers make a game of this, pulling within one. But Matthew Philp would score the attack's second shorthanded goal of the game, and Adam McMaster would put it away in the waning minutes. The Owen Sound attack come away with a 5-2 victory over the Rangers. As I said, two short-handed goals and Declan McDonald his third straight game with a goal, two points, earning second star honors. On to the Guelph Storm, two games scheduled, but a postponement in Saginaw means only one game on the road in the Sioux Friday night. It's the Greyhounds that would get on the board first. Dominic Mufara, look at this celebration, slamming the stick home, and the Storm did not like that. They answered with three consecutive power play goals. Pavel Gogolev with the first, Pavel Gogolev with the second, and Keegan Stevenson with the third. Three goals in a minute 51, all on the power play, and Pavel Gogolev gets the hat trick. Talk about a celebration after that. The Storm up 4-1. Jaden Pekka makes it 4-2 as we go to the third. Cedric Ralph puts the Storm back up by three goals. Dominic Mufara, his second of the game, gets the Sioux within two. And Joe Carroll makes a game of it. The Sioux are within one, but a two-on-one break in the closing seconds means an empty netter for the Guelph Storm. That's Cedric Ralph's second of the game. Pavel Gogolev with the hat trick and five points on the night as the Storm pick up a huge win in Sault Ste. Marie. Upcoming games for these two teams, Friday night, November the 8th for the Rangers. It's the annual Remembrance Day game. That is against the Guelph Storm in Kitchener, and then the Rangers head on the road on Sunday the 10th to Oshawa to face the Generals. For the Storm, as mentioned, they travel to Kitchener on Friday night, and then it's a rare Saturday night home game as they welcome the Kingston Frontenac. That's it for another episode of Your Region This Week. For more information on the show or if you have a story idea, visit our website, rogerstv.com, and fill out our proposal form at the bottom. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.